Welcome to my ultimate cookery course. Packed with quick cooking tips, know-how, and 100 recipes to stake your life on. OK, get ready for my ultimate guide to baking. Whether it's breads, cakes, tarts, pies or pastries, baking is one of the most seductive skills in the kitchen. It fills the house with fantastic aromas and puts irresistible food on the table. Now, I'm going to put you on the road to baking Nirvana, starting with an easy bread packed with big, gutsy flavours, olive, tomato and rosemary focaccia. I absolutely love baking bread. There's something really satisfying about doing it. And this focaccia recipe is very hands-on, but the end result is something really, really tasty. First off, start with the dough. Tip 500 grams of strong bread flour into a mixing bowl and add 20 grams of semolina. That gives the focaccia its sort of rustic charm. Now, if there's one thing focaccia needs, it's really good seasoning. You can't season bread after it's baked, so it's got to go in right at the very beginning. Sprinkle in 15 grams of dried yeast. Take some warm water and then 50 mils of olive oil. Top up that water. That gives it its really nice, silky, rich texture. Make a little well. Mix up that yeast, water, and oil in. Start off with the fingers. Keep the fingers nice and open. It's like a little sort of whisk going in there. I'm looking for a really nice sort of relaxed dough. Now, that's just starting to come together. Touch more water. With the oil in there, give it a little swirl. And in again. The secret is to sort of knead it gently. Don't overwork it. It's a sort of easy bread to make, a nice one to start off with when you're making bread for the first time. Basically, kneading means just knit it together. Just hanging. Lightly flour your board, and let's just knead that focaccia into a nice, smooth dough. Make sure you don't over-add too much flour, otherwise it sort of dries out the dough. Something quite magical about making bread, you can switch off and lose yourself. My first job for a three mission star establishment was a baker. I was 22 years of age and used to start at midnight. I was under such a tight schedule. One o'clock, white bread done. Two o'clock, brown bread. Three o'clock, sourdough. Four o'clock, cheese bread. Five o'clock, prove, bake. Six o'clock, <coughs> crack them open and taste. It was amazing. Beautiful. Look at that. Looks stunning. It hasn't even risen yet. Leave your dough to rise in a warm place till it's doubled in size. We call this proving. Look at that. Beautiful. A lot of chefs sort of need it for the second time, but I'm looking for a really nice, light, aerated focaccia. Take a tray. Touch of olive oil in there. Season it at the bottom. Really important. That's the exciting thing about a focaccia. You've got that really nice sort of salty top and salty bottom. And then just with a touch of olive oil on your hands, gently push that in. And almost massage it into the corners. It's possible to put sort of olives and tomatoes and garlic through the dough, but it never really allows the dough to sort of aerate properly when you put so much ingredients in. I'm going to stick mine on top, use your finger and sort of just push them in. Some salt on top, some pepper on top as well. I want some nice, fresh, amazing rosemary. Just hold the stalk and just pull off and then just sprinkle down. Generous on the rosemary. Really important to have that nice fragrance on top of the focaccia. Finish it off before it goes in with a little drizzle of olive oil. So it almost sinks in those little pockets of flavour, olive, tomato, rosemary and olive oil into the oven. Bake your focaccia at 200 degrees for 30 to 35 minutes. Beautiful. Mm. Smells delicious. Beautiful. You can hear how crispy that is. You can't beat a nice, warm, fresh slice of home-cooked focaccia. It's rustic, charming, and it's the perfect way to start baking, making homemade focaccia. 
is so addictive. Getting to grips with bacon is just a matter of confidence. And once you've grasped the basics, then the possibilities are limitless. Here are three more of my favourite super simple bread recipes to get you going. Kicking off with my simple soda bread. First up, measure out your dry ingredients. Plain flour, wholemeal flour, salt, caster sugar, and bicarbonate of soda. Mix, get 450 ml of buttermilk, pour most of it in and combine. Buttermilk has a wonderful, subtle, sour note that gives this bread a deliciously different taste. You can get it in most of the big supermarkets. If your dough is a bit stiff, add the rest of your buttermilk. Flour your board. Gently knead the mixture for about 30 seconds until it's all combined. Dust your baking tray. Place your dough in the center and score a deep crust with a knife to get a perfect crust. Then simply bake in a preheated oven for 30 to 35 minutes. Amazingly easy, absolutely delicious and foolproof. Hot, crusty, homemade soda bread whenever you want. My next no sweat bread recipe is even faster to make. Quick flatbreads with lemon, thyme and ricotta. For the dough mix, first slice a leek lengthwise and chop. And saute in a pan with hot olive oil and butter till tender. Season. Next, combine flour with a pinch of seasoning and olive oil. And mix in your cooked leeks. Bring the dough together in a bowl with a drop of warm water. Cover and rest for 20 minutes. Allowing the dough mixture to relax means the resulting bread will be nice and soft. Then dust the dough with flour. Mold into a sausage shape. Slice it into rounds. And flatten with a rolling pin. Then simply fry in a hot, dry pan. When golden and crisp on each side, Remove. For a simple supper, serve with ricotta cheese, lemon zest, and fresh thyme. So simple, so fast, and so versatile, flatbreads to die for. Next, how to make one of the world's most popular bread-based foods fast. Mozzarella and rosemary pizza. For the pizza dough, add yeast to warm water. Put in a tablespoon of sugar and leave to one side. In a separate bowl, add sieve flour. Make a well and add your olive oil and yeast mixture. Get your hands right in to bring it together. Then knead for about 10 minutes on a floured surface until even and smooth. Put back into the bowl, cover and leave in a warm place to prove. Once it's roughly doubled in size, knock any excess air out. Place back on your surface, divide your dough into four balls, and simply flatten. Add olive oil to a hot pan and put in the pizza dough. Pizza is usually cooked in a seriously hot oven, but this pan cook method works brilliantly. As the dough starts to bubble and the base turns golden, spoon over tomato passata, which is sieved tomatoes and tear in chunks of mozzarella. Then simply transfer to a hot grill until golden and bubbly. Finish with fresh rosemary. I love this classic combination, but you can easily adapt it and add your own favorite topping for a perfect pizza in minutes. This is my ultimate cookery course. 100 recipes to stake your life on. Right, now it's all about baking. I'm going to show you how to make a sponge cake smothered in luxury. So nice to finish with something sweet on top. But first, my guide to getting the best ingredients for your money. Whether I'm doing a simple sponge cake or making an elaborate tart, I want my baking to be the best it can be. So I always start with the best ingredients I can find. 
knowledge is crucial. The more you know personally about where your ingredients are from and how they're produced, the better. Flour. To get the lowdown on one of the key ingredients to brilliant baking, it always pays to ask an expert. And if there's one man who can really rise to the occasion, it's professional miller, Mark Abel. Doing a job like this means that you end up thinking and living flour. If that's obsession, I'm obsessed. At his mill, which has stood in Norfolk since 1835, Mark uses traditional stones to grind his flour, so he really knows his stuff. What actually comes off the field is something like this. Still husked, still needs to be processed before we can actually mill it. We then clean down to something like this, which is ready to be milled. All this is is a great big machine, which means you don't have to do it by hand. Rather than try and improve its performance by adding additional chemicals, what we're trying to do is mill it in the best way to get that performance from it. If you can put a seed in between stones, you can make flour out of it. Uh, it's that simple. Barley was what was traditionally used to, to make bread for people to live off. Oats can be used as well. And of course, good old spelt, the great grandmother of modern wheats, which has the most fantastic flavor and is, because of its primitive nature, the proteins in it are simpler. So a lot of people can eat that, they can't eat modern wheat. Keep your eyes on the shelves, look and see what is there. And if something strikes you as being potentially interesting, then get it and try it. Mix your own, blend your own together so that you can get the flavor that you want with the performance that you want. Mark's right. Different flowers perform and taste wildly different, and so they're well worth trying out. Here's my quick guide to some of the flowers I like using. Strong flour is the one to choose for standard bread making. The higher the protein content, the crustier your loaf will be. The flour hailing from Italy, double zero. It's super finely milled and perfect for pasta. I like to use it for pizzas too, because it produces a nice crispy crust like the one on my mozzarella and rosemary version. Rye flour will give you really dense, fruity-flavoured bread, fruit cakes or scones. If it's too heavy for you, just mix it with standard wheat flour. And when you are baking, remember that self-raising flour is just plain flour with raisin agents added. So if you run out, you can add baking powder and salt to your plain flour and get baking. That's the real stuff. That's it. Fresh flour straight out of the mill is so superior in flavour and performance that uh, it's only when you come to use it you realise what the difference is. If you're going to experiment with ingredients in baking, you still need to follow some basic rules to make sure things turn out brilliantly every time. Then, whether you're a master baker or you're just starting out, you can pimp up the classics, whether it's a Victoria sponge or a fruit scone. And that's the lesson perfectly illustrated by my next recipe, sponge with fresh ginger. Baking is part chemistry, part imagination. But you've got to rely on the rules for great results. It's the only time you'll see me reaching for the scales. First off, eggs, sugar, butter. And when I say weigh out the ingredients, it does literally mean weigh out to the final gram, 175. Now, 175 grams of sugar. That's 350 grams in total. Cream the butter and the sugar. To get a delicious, light sponge, start carefully on slow speed. Only speed up as the butter and sugar really start to cream together. Keep that really nice and light, and you can see how it's changed color. So important at the beginning. Eggs in, give them a little whisk. Adding one egg at a time stops the mix from separating. Second egg in. Third one in. That's what we're looking for. A really nice sort of light, aerated texture. Now, I'm going to flavour the sponge. A little teaspoon of vanilla extract. That perfumes the mix. One teaspoon of baking powder. That gives lightness. 175 grams of flour. And we're going to sieve it. A, to get rid of any lumps, and B, to keep it really nice and fine. 175. We're not going to beat that out. We're just going to lightly fold that in now. What I'm looking for is a really nice, loose dough. That's looking a little bit too firm, so just a little splash of milk. 
a couple of tablespoons. That relaxes the mixture down. Helps create that nice, almost dropping consistency. That's what I want. Just starting to drop. Take a non-stick loose bottom cake tin, grease it with butter, then coat it with flour to avoid the sponge sticking. Just give that a little shake. Make sure we get all the rim. Now, just get the back of the spatula. Make sure you've got no peaks on my sponge. To make sure the sponge bakes nice and evenly, tap the tin a few times to knock out any air pockets that might have formed in the mixture. Now, into the oven. Bake for 30 to 35 minutes at 180 degrees. As that's cooking, prepare the ginger cream for the centre. 300 ml of cream. Give that a nice whisk. Whisking the cream by hand gives you so much more control. And it's so easy to over whip cream. I want that nice, light ginger cream in the centre. I don't want it grainy. Nothing worse when cream starts to separate. Now, let's get into that three-quarter stage. And little stiff peaks. Stop that for two minutes. Fresh ginger. Now, get a really nice, large slice of ginger. It smells incredible. It's so fragrant. Peeling ginger is like sort of peeling a potato. Just take out all those little dark spots. Now, get your grater. If you haven't got a grater, you can chop the ginger really finely. I've got almost like a puree of ginger going through, but the juice as well. Take your knife and just scrape all that. Taste. It's mm, incredible. It's fragrant. And it's not sweet. It's got that really nice taste. Set that in the fridge. Mmm. That smells incredible. Run a knife around the outside to ensure the cake doesn't stick to the tin before turning it out. Now, get your hands under. Push up and out. While your cake cools, I'm going to do like a really nice, sweet chocolate coating. Pour 300 mils of double cream into a saucepan. Add two tablespoons of golden syrup to make the top nice and glossy. Then whisk. Chop this up really thinly so as it melts quickly. 50 grams of butter. That's going to give the chocolate a really nice shine. Boil your cream and mix it in. Give that a really good stir. As the chocolate and the butter melts, it thickens. Look how shiny that is. It's so nice to finish with something sweet on top. Topping done, time to build your sponge cake. Look at the halfway mark there. And just gently slice. And really take your time all the way through. Lift. Mm, that is delicious. That nice big dollop in the middle. Don't be stingy. Don't be tight with the cream. Another dollop on top. Spread that. Very carefully. Lift the lid and just sit that on top. That's why I start off with a little extra cream in there, so when I squash it down, the cream just pushes out to the side. I'm not finished. Pour the luxurious chocolate topping over the sponge. Be generous and make sure the cake is coated thoroughly to give it a gorgeous finish. Get the bottom of the ladle and spread. Whoa. One more. Whoa. You've got to know when to say stop when something looks that delicious. I just want to dive in there. Next, five more of my 100 tips to help you cook better. And of course, these are all about baking. Kicking off with how to whip cream. Whipping cream. Now, the important part here is whipping the cream to a three-quarter stage. If we over whip it, it will split, so be very careful. Double cream in. Now, when we whisk things, we whisk it in the shape of a figure of eight. And if you spin the bowl as you whip the cream, you get to release it from the bottom so it whips evenly. Whisk, whisk, whisk. And it should just sit inside the whisk and start to sort of fall out. Just perfect. 
Three quarter stage, double cream, done. Room temperature cream whips much faster than cold, so you'll need to take your cream out of the fridge 30 minutes before you want to whip it. Unless, of course, you want to work on your biceps. A great tip to prevent milk and cream from boiling over in a saucepan is to simply lay a wooden spoon across the top. The cream bubbles will rise up and hit the wooden handle and then fall back into the pan instead of bubbling over. Sticky stuff like treacle and golden syrup can be a real mess to measure out. My tip is to rub the spoon with a neutral oil, like rapeseed, and any sticky ingredients will slide straight off. And my tip for greasing cake tins is to keep old butter wrappers on hand and use them to crease when needed. Follow my ultimate cookery course, packed with key lessons, top tips, and 100 recipes to stake your life on. And you'll literally be cooking yourself into a better chef. Many of these amazing recipes are on my app. Please check out the App Store for details. Go on, get cooking. OK, this time, I'm going to help you achieve better baking. The great thing about pastry is, if you follow the basic rules, the possibilities are endless. Whether it's simple short crust or flaky phyllo, you just need a bit of practice to get it right. My first recipe uses lovely buttery short crust pastry to make a dish that's as delicious as it is simple. Leek and pancetta quiche. Short crust pastry is one of the staples of the kitchen. It is so versatile, but the good news is it's one of the easiest pastries to make. Trust me, when you crack it, it can make a real difference to your cooking. Take a sieve. What do you think of short crust pastry? It's sort of semi-flaky, but it's rich, buttery. Start by sifting 200 grams of plain flour into a mixing bowl. Large pinch of salt. 200 grams of unsalted butter. Bring the butter up to room temperature. If you let the butter become too soft, then the flour sort of doesn't absorb it. In with your fingers. Rub together first. Now, the secret is grab big handfuls and squeeze the butter into the flour. So look what's happened. Literally in 30 seconds, I've got that nice crumbly texture. Now, a couple of tablespoons of water. Nothing worse when the pastry's so wet. You can't bring it together. It needs to shape like a nice, rich cookie dough. And it's just a touch too dry. So, one more tablespoon of water. And there you go. It's coming nicely. Now, that's what I want. A nice sort of firm ball of pastry. Onto the board. I'm going to use these, one of the strongest parts of the body. Pull towards you and push back down. Use those wrists to really knead it together. So just that nice sort of smooth texture. Now, wrap it in cling film. Set that in the fridge for 20 minutes. Really important that you let the shortcut pastry relax. Now to make the quiche. You can use just an ordinary flan dish, but I love making them in mini frying pans, which gives them an extra rustic charm. Brush with oil to stop the pastry from sticking. Once the pastry is at room temperature, roll it out to a nice even thickness. Place it in the center of your little pan. Turn it in. Don't use your fingers, because what we don't want is any holes in this. Just get a little bit of dough, because that sort of acts like a little sort of mallet. Flattens it out nicely. I'm building a sort of extra lip, because that way I can get the filling at its absolute maximum levels. We're going to cook them blind first. To blind bake simply means to pre-cook your pastry before adding the filling. This ensures you'll have a fantastic crisp pastry. Add a sheet of foil or baking paper and weigh it down. You can use rice, pulses or ceramic baking stones. Just make sure you keep them for the next time. Into the oven, 200 degrees for 10 minutes. Now for the filling. I'm going to do a classic quiche, bacon and leeks. This is a 
an amazing cured pancetta. Pancetta is an Italian cured meat made from belly pork seasoned with things like juniper, nutmeg, fennel. A great substitute is unsmoked bacon. As the pancetta gets lovely and crispy, finely sliced leeks and add. Whoa, leeks and bacon, nice. Really important to cook those leeks down. That's exactly what I want. Those leeks are almost sort of caramelized, slightly crispy. The flavor's amazing. I just drain them off. So any excess fat gets drained. A couple of tablespoons of cream. That gives it this really nice richness. I want two thirds garnish, i.e. bacon and leeks in my quiche, and one third of the savory custard. Touch of salt, touch of pepper. And I grate some Gruyere cheese. That makes a really nice sort of creamy, less of an eggy quiche. Take my amazing, crispy pancetta and leeks in. Mm. Give that a good mix. Needs one more little thing, some freshness. Flat leaf parsley. Incredible. Really important just to taste mm. the mixture. With the quiche filling ready, next, finish off the pastry. Remove the foil and weights and return to the oven to get it lovely and golden all over. Now, when we fill them, give that a really good mix up. Beautiful. Grate over some more cheese, which will bubble up and melt beautifully. And then into the oven. Bake your quiche for 15 to 20 minutes. Incredible. It's got that nice sort of cheese on toast smell from the top. It's sort of baked. But the secret of any good quiche is in the short crust, because that's the hero. There are lots of different types of pastry. So, to help you put you on the road to pastry perfection, here are three of my simple pastry recipes that you can easily cook at home. First up, my indulgent chocolate tarts. First, combine softened butter and sugar and cream until soft. Break in an egg and mix well. Next, fold in the flour. Pour the mixture onto a floured surface and simply knead it lightly till it's well combined. Then shape into a disc and chill. Then simply roll out your pastry until it's about a quarter of a centimetre thick. Cut into small discs then gently press into lightly greased, loose bottom mini tart tins and prick the bottom to prevent the pastry from bubbling. Rest in the fridge. This ensures that when the pastry bakes, it will turn out nice and soft. Then bake it till golden. As they cool, make the gorgeous, silky chocolate filling. Place a mixing bowl over a pan of gently boiling water. This is known as a bain marie. Then add double cream, butter and plain chocolate. Then stir until it melts and it is glossy and smooth. Then pour it into the crisp and golden pastry cases. And simply tap to level and chill until set. So easy, so indulgent and so delicious. Eat them with creme fraiche, ice cream or simply by themselves. Perfect. My next dish is an irresistible take on a Latin American classic. Beef empanadas. First, finely chop onion and garlic. Sweat in a pan of hot olive oil until tender. Add paprika, cinnamon, and cumin, and stir. Cooking the spices off intensifies the flavor. Add beef mince to the pan, brown, and season. Add chili flakes for a fiery kick. Next, dried oregano chopped green olives and chopped boiled eggs. 
Once it's mixed through, set aside to cool. For the empanada cases, roll out puff pastry. This stuff's so time consuming to make at home. So do what I do, cheat and use shop bought. Cut into discs. Spoon the mixture into one half of the disc, leaving roughly a centimeter border around the edge. Brush the edge of one half of the disc with egg and fold it over. Crimp the edges with your fingers to seal and remove air pockets. Then simply cook in a medium oven until golden brown. Super easy, super quick, and super tasty. Serve with chimichurri, a spicy South American herb salsa. This is what Cornish pasties dream of being when they grow up. My next dish uses super fine filo pastry and is a variation on a Moroccan classic. Easy chicken pastilla. First, chop onions, ginger, then fry them in hot olive oil. Add cinnamon, and to give the mix a subtle sweet note, a pinch of sugar. Then season. Chop cooked chicken thighs and add to the mix. Pour in chicken stock and then simmer. Stir in whole lightly beaten eggs, which thicken the sauce, and cook. Add in sliced almonds, then set aside to cool. Now build your pastilla. Filo is another pastry that's tricky to make at home, but you can buy fantastic filo, so cheat. Brush each sheet with melted butter and lay four sheets into a greased baking tin. Spoon in half of the fantastic aromatic chicken filling. Add four more buttered sheets of filo pastry and simply pile in the rest of the delicious chicken. Finally, cover with a couple of sheets of filo and fold over all the draped sides. Brush with more butter, then bake in a hot oven for 10 to 15 minutes until the top is crispy and golden brown. You want all the filo paste wonderfully crunchy and golden. So turn over and return for another 10 minutes. When done, remove. And for a different but delicious sweet finishing touch, dust lightly with icing sugar and cinnamon. Intensely aromatic, sweet and savory, crispy and succulent, an extraordinary pie that has to be tasted to be believed. Three types of pastry, three mouth-watering fillings, three more recipes you can stake your life on. And so simple to do. Beautiful. For easy, accurate baking, you need the right kit. You don't need to spend a fortune on masses of kitchen equipment. Here's my quick guide to two essentials you need for baking. Scales and a sieve. Baking is so popular now, these scales are absolutely essential, especially when you have to follow the recipe to the exact gram. These digital scales are so easy to follow, they can convert from pounds and ounces to kilos and grams. And more importantly, so much easier to use than your mum's old weights. Absolutely perfect. A sieve. Make sure you get one with a long handle and balancing hooks so you can rest it over your mixing bowl or a pan. Easy thing to have in the drawer, costs nothing, but it's so effective, especially with baking. With these two pieces of kit, you'll definitely be on the right road to baking like a pro. Welcome back to my ultimate cookery course. Next, on my guide to better baking, I'll be teaching you how to make a stylishly simple and sumptuous cheesecake. Beautiful. But first, be it baking or any type of cooking, it always pays off to use the best ingredients you can find. And you're never too old to learn from the experts. Next, my shopping guide to getting the best milk and cream. When it comes to knowing what makes great quality milk, dairy farmer Charlie Ray is your man. He's been producing milk from his herd of hand-reared specialist breed, Jersey cattle, for over 30 years. Yeah, they're part of the family, almost. So, he's up to his wellies in the stuff. Jersey milk is very high butter fat, which therefore means it's, it is very creamy, it's very creamy to drink, and it's the best quality milk you'd get anywhere. Jersey cows are very docile, very friendly, very easy to manage, and this is my favourite. Um, she's about 17 years old, she's called Misty, 
If you think of the large Arctic milk tank, as you see going up and down the motorways, she's filled one and a half of those on her own. I reckon these are happy cows. They've got a dry roof over their heads, they've got a dry bed, and they've got as much food as they want. The happier they are and the better kept they are, the better the quality of the milk that comes out the other end. This is what's called in a breast milking parlour. Go on, down the other way. And it suits us in as much as we've got contact with the cows, we can treat each cow individually. The milk goes up through a metre into that line, through a big filter and into the tank. Well, there you are. Without this product, you wouldn't have chocolate, cheese, yogurts. It's the base ingredient in so many things that you buy and totally take for granted. And where there's milk, there's also glorious cream, essential for brilliant baking and lots of savoury dishes too. Single cream is around 18% fat, so it's a lighter option for topping desserts or stirring into savoury sauces. Whereas double cream, at nearly 50% fat, is lovely and rich in panna cottas or in a carbonara sauce, as well as being able to withstand boiling, whipping and freezing. Sour cream, soured with a similar culture to that used in yoghurt, is a really tasty topping for chilies or baked potatoes. Clotted cream, rich, thick, and a delicious indulgence, served with puddings and scones or in ice cream to make it extra rich. And mascarpone, actually a creamy, soft Italian cheese, famously used in Italian dessert, tiramisu. It's also fantastic in cheesecakes. It is font of all life. In great baking, as with all cooking, sometimes less is more. The easiest dishes look and taste spectacular when they're done well. And it doesn't come any simpler or more stylish than my next dish, wonderful baked cheesecake. For me, food always has to be impressive. But when it comes to desserts, often you see sponge sugar or wild decorations. Remember, simple, is always the most impressive. This cheesecake is so straightforward, yet so delicious. Now, cream cheese, leave it out of the fridge for five or 10 minutes. Go nice and soft. Trust me, your arms will be thanking you. Sugar in. This cheesecake is New York cheesecake, because it's baked. So there's no base. Start creaming the cheese and the sugar. Spending the amount of time I do in the States, if there's one thing they know how to do out there, is the most amazing, impressive cheesecake. Rich, delicious, but so simple. Work the bowl. Lift the bowl to your advantage. Really whisk. Whisk, whisk, whisk. Lovely. Nice and creamy. Now, get your eggs. Add the eggs to the mixture bit by bit. Doing it this way, it's more efficient. A, you're incorporating a lot of air. B, the mixture doesn't separate. The last of your egg. Lovely. Of course, you can use an electric mixer, but why go to the gym when you can just make a cheesecake a day? A cheesecake a day. Keep the bingo wings away. Now, a couple of tablespoons of flour. Give it a whisk. Stops it from going lumpy. Now, I want to scent that cheesecake. I've got the freshness and zest of the lemon in there. I want to sort of tart it up even more. Fold in some fresh raspberries. So sort of just mix them through. Be careful not to crush them. Then grease a cake tin with butter. This will ensure your cheesecake slides out beautifully. Get your mix. Let that fall in. Now take your cake tin and just tap it. The mixture hits the bottom of the cake tin. The raspberries rise and you've got raspberries at the top, the middle and the bottom. And it also stops all those little pockets of air trapping underneath the mixture in the cake tin. So there's no holes in the cheesecake. Now into the oven, 180 degrees for 35 to 40 minutes. Mmm, slightly souffléed up. 
pull off. That's the colour I wanted on top. And look at it. It's one of the simplest, yet the most stylish cheesecakes anywhere. Beautiful. Next, my tricks of the trade and kitchen tips. Kicking off with how to handle pastry. Lightly flour the surface, pastry on top, rolling pin. Now, the secret now is don't overwork the pastry. Firm push, turn the pastry round, and this helps to even the pastry. Turn and roll. Now, as it starts to crack, don't worry. Just by pushing it back together, it sort of unites the pastry immediately. Apply pressure, turn the pastry. Now, the average thickness is down to a one pound coin. Back on to the rolling pin and look, beautiful. For the neatest edge on tarts and quiches, my tip is to let the pastry hang over the side of the tin when you bake it. Trim around the edge once the pastry is cooked, it will give you a cleaner edge and prevent it from shrinking. My tip for even rising is to place cakes and tarts in the centre of the oven so the air can circulate all the way round them. To test your cake to make sure it's done, insert a knife, skewer or even a piece of spaghetti in the centre. If there's mixture stuck to it, it's not done yet. If it comes out clean, your cake's ready. If you don't have any baking beans to hand for blind baking, you can use any rice, grain or pulse. You won't be able to cook with them afterwards, but do keep them to reuse them next time. When you're folding egg whites or whipped cream into cake mixtures, you want to retain as much air in the mixture as you can. My tip, use a metal spoon, as the sharp, thin edge will keep more of the air in. Follow my ultimate cookery course crammed with key lessons. Top tips and 100 recipes to stake your life on, and you'll literally be cooking yourself into a better chef. Many of these amazing recipes are on my app. Please check out the App Store for details. Go on, get cooking.